a warm welcome to this video and I'm delighted that Dr. Michael Cohen has decided to join us again. Some of you with long memories may remember we discussed the importance of vitamin D and uh, iron in uh, maintaining health and to some extent treating disease. What we really agree strongly on is getting the basic things right that are often missed. Now, Dr. Cohen is a general practitioner, a family doctor. He trained in the, lived in, from the UK, now works uh, and lives in uh, Israel. And uh, he's also got a YouTube channel, What's Up Doc, which we'll be putting links to, of course. Dr. Cohen, thank you for coming. Great to see you again. Thank you for having me, John. Nice to see you again. It's been a while. Thank you. <laughs> it has. Now, one of the basic things about this channel and indeed your channel, is, is the evidence base. We want to carry out procedures, work with patients, but that's got to be based on evidence. And um, surely the best form of evidence that we can use, and we should use it as much as possible, in deciding what treatments are appropriate is the randomised, double-blind, controlled trial. Would you agree with this, Doctor? Well, I think in general, yes. I mean, obviously, this has become very much entrenched in medicine for quite a number of years, certainly as long back as when I was at medical school, it was becoming more and more a thing. Um, and clearly, we get a lot of very important data from randomized controlled trials. Uh, they use very large numbers of people. They're not cheap um, when they're done properly in, in large numbers and statistically significant numbers. Um, and they can be very helpful in giving us um, a framework for looking at, um, you know, what's, what's really proven statistically to work for X number of people. The problem with them is that we don't know what works for everybody. And when I say that, I, I, I have many colleagues consultant specialists in various fields, whether it be cardiology, neurology, whatever. And we often come to these conversations together where we understand that as much as the data shows X or Y, we all have many patients who don't follow the data or they will respond to other treatments better. Um, the whole way in which trials are also performed is that there is a hypothesis, we try and test the hypothesis, and we see, okay, this seems to work in this number of patients, and it works better than a placebo. So a placebo, you know, usually has around a 30% effect, and actually any drug that has an effect better than that and is pretty safe is considered better than placebo, and, and then we do different trials to show a drug against placebo, a drug against drug, and a double-blinded study for, for the listeners here is one in which both the person um, performing the study and the people who are receiving the treatment do not know, either of them are not supposed to know what the treatment is that they're getting. And only later on um, is the study unblinded. So they use various coding methods. And at a certain point, it comes to, well, okay, now we found out, so it's a minimized bias, we found out why, um, we found out which one works and how much, and if it works at all. So this, this is a randomized study. Um, they're very useful um, um, in general for, for many, uh, answering many clinical questions. But again, people are not statistics, people are individuals. And um, the problem with randomized control style, randomized controlled trials is that they don't apply in certain situations um, and there could be other um, uh, the other situations whereby um, a different type of study would be better. Um, so for example if a uh, condition is very rare or it occurs infrequently um, uh, or it's very difficult to get a large sample size then an RCT, a randomized controlled trial, is not necessarily going to be helpful. Um, if the treatment is invasive or it carries a significant risk, again, there's a lot of ethical issues with doing trials in those cases, um, and also tr it's unethical to use placebo groups. Um, if the treatment that's going to be studied is for long-term use, um, which would make it very difficult for us to blind the study because at some point it will become uh, obvious what the patient's receiving, if they're getting an active drug or not, 
Um, if the intervention is very complex, if uh, the population that's being studied is quite heterogeneous, meaning that it's many different types of um, people, let's say, um, it becomes very difficult to control for all of these confounding factors, and so you could use other study designs. Um, and uh, the other type of thing is that when you're trying to study a problem that's not um, quantitative, but more qualitative, and looking at um, the effect on a person, quality of life, uh, what their functional outcomes are, this is also another reason why randomized controlled trials are not necessarily the be-all and end-all for study design. Um, so in those sorts of cases, we start looking at other types of studies. And one of these types of studies is what's known as an N of 1 or uh, N equals 1 study, which is basically taking an individual patient and the patient becomes the, um, the study and the control. Uh, and there are different ways of doing this. So you could actually take a patient and give them a medication for an, a period of time or a treatment of some sort. And then you could have a washout period when they're not receiving the medicine or they're receiving a placebo. And you can compare the patient to himself or herself. Um, uh, and although in some ways this is less robust, um, there can be a lot of um, good sides to doing a study like this. Um, um, and this is something that I think is actually very important to, to bring here today, which is that I think all doctors that I know certainly in some sense whether they realize it or they don't are doing these trials on their patients meaning the patient is the the best um, uh, is the best proof of, their, of what works for them ultimately I, all the statistics can say this or that but at the end of the day you've got a patient in front of you and you may have something that works better for them uh, it could be a strategy of treatment it may not be a standard treatment but the important thing is the results that you get and minimizing the side effects. So we're trying to individualize patient care. This is this is almost like a sort of a bespoke approach, really, rather than saying because this is true in general, it might not be true in this specific instance. So each patient is is assessed, planned, the implementation is carried out, they are evaluated on an individualized basis. Yeah, I would say that's absolutely correct. Um, and, I, you know, I can think of, I, it's difficult to think of everybody, obviously, but I can think of a lot of patients over the years who um, don't fit in neatly into a box. And um, the, um, uh, the studies would say that we should be treating them with um, drug this or drug that. Uh, and in fact, they respond to something else entirely and better. And that's what we should be doing if we're being ethical in our treatment and and being um, uh, as loyal as possible to what we're trying to do for our patients. Do you think it's necessary to still to sort of clearly define the patient's condition and, and give the patient a clear diagnosis as much as possible? Um, well, yes and no. I think that uh, it's, we should all be working with diagnoses, but we don't always know the diagnosis for certain. And very often we are trying to firstly make sure that the diagnosis is not anything terrible, nothing, um, uh, you know, not someone's got an active cancer that we're missing or something like this, um, uh, or an unstable heart condition or, or other dangerous condition, let's say. Um, so from that perspective it's important to have that part of the diagnosis do we always have the complete diagnosis I don't think so I think that very often people present with symptoms and they have more than one diagnosis and we should try and establish what all the diagnoses are of course um, but we have our limitations and so we have to look at a person and say well this is the thing that I think is safe to do for, for this person so the first thing is the safety. The first thing is try not to harm the patient. And the second thing is obviously that we're trying to do good for the patient. We're trying to help them. Um, and we want to do that in the, the least harmful way. Um, so in terms of coming to a specific diagnosis, yes, of course, it's ideal. Um, but does it always change exactly how we're going to do things? Not necessarily. And as long as we're seeing an improvement, as long as we are 
monitoring them well, as long as they're going up through, as long as they're having proper follow up, I think that we're 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 in the right ballpark of what we should be doing. So it's almost like an empirical experiment, really, for each patient. Yes, some patients will fit the stereotype, other patients won't fit the stereotype. In that case, you diagnose the patient as mm -hmm. far as you can go, but you you almost uh, intuit. A, you intuitively know that a particular approach might be right for a particular patient. And as long as you follow that up and monitor right. that patient. Yes, so I, I, I'm very hot on follow up. I believe that you can be a brilliant doctor and miss an important diagnosis just because you don't have the opportunity to see the person um, frequently enough, let's say, in the progress of their illness or treatment uh, and you could be not such a brilliant doctor and be better for the patient sometimes just because you're able to follow them up in a more um, in a more um, uh, let's say a close having a sort of closer follow-up with them um, and I think yes patients uh, obviously we're all different um, no two people are alike um, people respond differently to different medications, different doses of medications, they have side effects, um, they have different beliefs about their treatment and that may influence how they take their medication or don't take their medication. So it's very important to have people on side when you treat them, right? There's no, we know there are statistics that go back donkey's years, um, which show that people often come, for example, to see a doctor and the doctor writes a prescription, they think they've done the right thing for the patient, which they probably have, but the patient feels good enough that they got the prescription, they, they discard the prescription, they, they never buy it or they buy it and they never use it. Um, and uh, so it, it's better to get people on board with the treatment that's gonna suit them as well. And using, um, I'm gonna use the term of N equals one or N of one um, um, in the sense that yes, everybody Every treatment is an experiment, actually. We don't know how anyone's definitely going to react. There are cases where we nearly know completely how someone will react, how almost everyone will react. And those could be in emergency situations, um, giving someone adrenaline, um, giving an antibiotic in certain situations. There are many things that we do know, but there are plenty of times that we don't actually know that this drug is gonna suit this patient um, for various reasons. And so, if we can tailor our thinking a bit more towards the patient, we can be far, uh, we can have a far better effect on their health. So humans are so complicated that while they are predictable to an extent, we also kind of work as a chaotic system, don't we? So what might influence me or affect me in one way might affect you in a in a slightly different way or in, in some instances in a quite dramatic different way. And this is why we need this ongoing continual reassessment, following patients up, seeing the effect of the treatment, titrating the treatment, stopping the treatment, amending the treatment. All of these things should be done on a, on a longitudinal basis. So it's not just a matter of one visit to the doctor and that's it. it we need a level of follow-up as we follow the evolution of the patient's condition.